Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome indeed to the Florida Food Policy Council's monthly Florida Food Forum. The forum is hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council. I am Del Deschamps, the host, and we welcome to all who are joining us through cyber systems or on phone lines or who are listening to this in the future through the magic of recording of the event. Our topic for this month is Food is Not a Human Right, Issues in Food Democracy. With us from the Council is the Council's Operations and Communications Manager, Kendra Love. Kendra will handle the technical and managerial aspects of the meeting. Uh, we want to uh, take a moment and let everyone know that the Florida Food Policy Council does rely on donations, memberships, and sponsorships for our operations. We are a chartered not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing the health and security of the Florida food system. Please share support through the donation link on the website. For information on sponsoring a future forum, see the website or contact Kendra Love. We're pleased today to recognize our two major sponsors for the Florida Food Forum, and that's the organization called FEED and J. Haskins Law. FEED stands for Food for Health, the Environment, Economy, and Democracy. It is based in Fort Lauderdale. FEED is a consultancy dedicated to the ideals of its name. It specializes in food system planning, GIS analysis, advocacy, and education about food systems in healthy communities. The contact for FEED is Anthony Oliveri. J. Haskins Law, our other sponsor, is located in Tampa. And J. Haskins Law empowers communities with legal and risk management tools to exercise food sovereignty. The contact for J. Haskins Law is Jesse Haskins. We're most appreciative of FEED and J. Haskins Law for sponsoring this month's forum. For information on sponsoring a future forum, see our website or contact our operations and communications director, Kendra Love. The focus of this edition of the Florida Food Forum is food is not a human right, issues in food democracy. Our guests for today are researchers whose studies focus on the title of our forum, namely the extremely critical and complex relationship of food and human rights. The relevance of this topic can, focuses on not simply the title, but also in ethics, culture, intersectionality, food policy, politics, and social justice. I would also add that even broader issues that relate to government systems, as well as religion's involvement in culture, are front and center in this topic. A document introducing the presenters for today is on the Council's website, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, which will give much more detail at this point. If you registered for the event, you've already seen the background information, the biographical information on our presenters. I'll share a little bit in just a moment. I will note, however, by way of my introduction, that today's topic is of special relevance to both the professional academic study and assessment of food systems, as well as the lived experience of millions of Americans and easily a billion people worldwide. Arguably, any serious engagement with inequities in the food system, especially in terms of policy, must begin with the realization stated in the title of our session, food is not a human right. Importantly, and perhaps tragically, the pandemic has made many communities acutely aware of the fragility of the industrial food system and the near total absence of viable local food systems. When these facts are considered in light of the absence of food justice, food rights, and food democracy, the possibility of even greater challenges for the food insecure is even more likely. And so to tell us more about food and human rights, we're fortunate to have two terrific guests, Lana Shia Badin and William Schambacher. I'll introduce both and then proceed with the presentations, first by Lana and then by Will. Lana Shia Badin is a behavioral research lead, is the behavioral research lead in Ruminate, a nonprofit 
Innovation Lab focused on leveraging behavioral science to inspire social change within the food system. She is a graduate of Oregon Health and Science University's Master of Science program in food systems and society. She focused her thesis on the relationship between the nationwide empathy deficit and the tolerance for structural injustice in the US food system. She also holds certification as a plant-based uh, in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. She is a Lebanese American, plant-based home cook and an artist. Lana is committed to working towards a more equitable and empathetic society. Also with us today is Will Schombacher. Will is an associate professor of religious studies at the University of South Florida. His research interests concentrate on religious and social ethics with a focus on the global food system and globalization and poverty. He's the author of several books, most recently, The Human Right to Food, Combating Human Hunger and Forging a Path to Food Sovereignty. He is one of the leading international researchers in issues related to food sovereignty and food justice. His forthcoming book, Food Insecurity, a reference handbook, will be published next year. It addresses the history of food insecurity in the United States. We're currently working on, with local religious organizations on projects to build gardens in the Tampa Bay area and serving as co-chair of the University of South Florida's Urban Food Sovereignty Policy Group. I encourage everyone to take a look at the announcements for today's forum for more information on our two distinguished guests. And so to get started, uh, we will welcome Lana's presentation and then we'll turn to Will for additional perspectives. So Lana, welcome indeed to the Florida Food Forum. Please share with us your insights, understandings, and assessments. Lana? Del, Del I think we're gonna do the reverse. Yes, I was just gonna say that. There we go, we're gonna do the reverse. So <laughs> thank you for letting me know. And uh, we'll start then with Will who's been introduced previously. Thank you all uh, for having me uh, today, Dell, and, and, and the, the Policy Council. I really uh, uh, appreciate the, the invitation. I'll go ahead and jump into to our, our topic today, Food is Not a Human Right. Now, we think of this when we see this title as somewhat of a provocative sort of title, and, and, and the reason why I subtitle my presentation today, Food Sovereignty and the Fight for the Right to Food, uh, is because at first glance, it does sort of appear to be a provocative statement, but in reality, in practice, uh, I think what we have found bo both on a global stage, but also here locally in our uh, communities, that food, in fact, is not a human right. And this is really this topic of, of food as a human right was the subject of my first book, The Politics of Food, and primarily where I engaged the concept of food sovereignty. So what I would like to spend my time doing today is, is talking briefly about the food sovereignty narrative. Uh, the food sovereignty narrative as the subtitle of my first book, The Global Conflict Between Food Security and Food Sovereignty, indicates uh, food sovereignty was established in part as a response to the failure of global institutions, uh, the World Bank, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, other trade arrangements enshrined in uh, the WTO, uh, for example. Uh, these organizations primarily used sort of this standard conventional food security narrative, which good in itself and in its motivation focused more on ensuring proper caloric intake, ensuring that we had enough food to feed the world uh, without much regard to uh, the cultural importance of food, without much regard to how food is produced. And while in its origins, food security uh, was noble in its goal and still remains uh, a noble goal and part of food sovereignty, what food sovereignty has done is change that narrative slightly uh, to focus more on uh, other dynamics related to food. In practice, uh, food sovereignty emerged out of the landless peasant, small scale farmer and fisher people environments and movements, La Via Campesina uh, in particular, sometimes roughly translated as the farmer's way or path. And has become one of the largest global food and agricultural justice social movements uh, presently uh, today. And there's various formations of it um, uh, around the world. Uh, to quote directly from La Via Campesina, just to get us started here, as a sort of the precursor or the, uh, the progenitor of food sovereignty, uh, the operational secretary at Rafael Al <clears throat> Algeria in the early 2000s, we read, I think that what really unites us is a fundamental commitment to humanism 
because the antithesis of this is individualism and materialism. For us in the Via Campesina, the human aspect is a fundamental principle. So we see the person, man and woman, as the center of our reason for being. And this is what we struggle for. For this family, that is the center of all. What unites us is a spirit of transformation and struggle. We aspire to a better world, a more just world, a more humane world, a world where real equality and social justice exist. And so as a precursor via Campesina, led to ultimately the emergence of a more robust concept of food sovereignty. I should mention food sovereignty is an evolving uh, uh, concept. It's a concept, it's a movement, it's a way of life. Uh, but to give you sort of the, the, the rough outlines, food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. So right here off the bat, we see when we talk about food as a right, food sovereignty is talking about a human right to food that is also accompanied by uh, a notion of food that is healthy and culturally appropriate. Second, food puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the very heart of food systems and policies, rather than in the hands and the demands of markets and corporations, as we increasingly see today, dominating uh, the world stage, uh, the role of corporate agriculture, so on and so forth. We also see that food sovereignty defends the interests and inclusion of the next generation. So food sovereignty is forward looking, not looking just right here and right now, but also down the road, down the road for our children and our grandchildren. It offers a strategy to resist and dismantle the current corporate trade and food regime, as we might call it. And <clears throat> directions for food farming and pastoral and fishery systems must be determined by local producers and users. Again, a contradistinction to the current system of corporate trade and corporate food regimes, right? We are focusing on the local food producers and users. And lastly, what I would also argue um, here in the United States, food sovereignty as it is embodied in many local food movements, is also accompanied by a strong notion of food justice and the struggle against structural inequities uh, related specifically to race, gender, and class. Uh, so here in the United States, we see this in many, uh, for example, in the organization that I helped co-found at USF, the Urban Food Sovereignty Group. Uh, we look at those uh, um, inequities in race, gender, and class uh, issues as well. And this ultimately led to my most recent book, Food as a Human Right, combating global hunger and forging a path to food sovereignty. This is really where we get to the core of our theme today. Now we know that human rights is talked about, particularly in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. But with respect to food, we find its articulation most prominent in two sort of sub or attending covenants, the covenant on civil and political rights, as well as related to food, the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, this ISC SCR, which stipulates uh, that states who sign on to this covenant, this agreement, have an obligation to respect, to protect, and to fulfill the right to food. Now, what does this mean? Uh, we need to know the details of this. Well, the obligation to respect the right to food requires that states and parties do not take any measures that result in preventing basic access to, to, to food. Uh, to protect this right means that states need to ensure that enterprises or individuals do not deprive other individuals or communities from that access to food. And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, the obligation to fulfill this right uh, in, in such States must proactively engage in activities that are intended to strengthen people's access and utilization of resources to ensure uh, a livelihood of dignity um, and free from food insecurity. And it is these, this last uh, uh, element, this obligation to fulfill, which has been a sticking point for many governments, particularly the United States. And here's where we really get to the crux of the argument here. Uh, food is not a human right. Uh, of the 160 some odd nations globally that have signed, that have ratified the right to food as it's uh, declared in the, the, the UN covenant here, uh, we read domestically, the United States pursues policies that promote access to food. And it is our objective to achieve a world where everyone has adequate access to food, but we do not treat the right to food as an enforceable obligation. Notice right here off the bat, here is clearly stated the United States position, namely we do not uh, ratify or agree that there is a human right to food. As such, the United States is not a party to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So given this lack of U.S. interest in providing food security, uh, I argue now is the time that we focus on food sovereignty as a more radical approach uh, to change. And so food sovereignty introduces a way in which we can rethink about 
the human concept or the human right to food. Food sovereignty and the right to food uh, at its core, I would argue, is a right to self-determination, the right uh, to determine and choose our food systems. Uh, at the very least, this involves adopting a food sovereignty paradigm, which calls for governments to eliminate laws, regulations, and policies that prohibit or discourage or impede the people's right to produce their own food, to protect their own uh, community health, and to provide their for, for their families when certain social safety nets are eliminated or obstructed, as we often see when it comes to uh, government intervention in the elimination of those social safety nets. And lastly, as I mentioned before, the cultural right to to food involves recognizing this interconnectedness of both the natural, the ecological, and the human world. So not only do we need uh, to recognize that the world and nature provides subsistence, but we also want to add that element of human dignity. We not only feed ourselves, but we also want to live a dignified life as well. And as such, we need a more robust concept of food security. Food sovereignty does this, but we need attending uh, notions of food justice, as I mentioned before, but also a concept I would like to introduce, namely that of agroecology. Agroecology, roughly defined, is the integrative study of ecology and the entire food system, encompassing ecological, social, and economic dimensions, as my little graphic shows here. We have the social sphere, the economic sphere, um, and the environmental sphere. And within those circles, we have health, gender, uh, society, culture, in the economic sphere, income, marketing, trade, as well as our traditional environmental concerns. All of these overlap uh, with food production in the food sovereignty model and agroecology. Namely, food production resides in all three of these spheres, and we need to look at this in a more holistic approach. This will lead us to envision more food just systems. Agroecology must include programs, for instance, and platforms in which anti-structural racism um, and genderism in the community food systems is addressed and addressed in a more robust way. Um, food sovereignty then can be thought of as the right to determine our own food policy, which involves at the very least certain transdisciplinary research collaboratives for myself in the university and in education systems, but also uh, the role of grassroots activism. Uh, the role of the community. Uh, this is where it is of utmost importance that we have the university and the community engaging in uh, collaborations with one another. And so this leads me to sort of uh, where I will transition to, to Lana's presentation. But what we can draw from this, the, the combination of agroecology, food justice, and human rights, uh, this reframes the discussion on the human right to food to focus on impediments to access to healthy, nutritious, and culturally meaning food. Uh, we need to think of the right to food through a food sovereignty frame, which will allow us to hold our political and educational institutions responsible for ensuring even the most basic uh, uh, access to food requirements or thresholds. When we add food sovereignty plus agroecology, this will lay the foundation for environmental, economic, and social justice components necessary for political change and a more democratic food system, which Lana will talk about. And through agroecological education, as well as pedagogical methods, we can empower people to grow their own food systems. And local knowledge sharing is really at the core of this. Food and agricultural knowledge, coordination between social justice organizations, uh, all in an effort to establish alliances across both research and academic disciplines, but as well across activism networks related to uh, the food and economic justice uh, systems. So with that said, I will transition over to Lana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Let me just quickly share my presentation. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lana Shahabuddin, and I am absolutely thrilled uh, to be here today and co-present this very important topic to you all. I, just to give you a brief background, I started out with a natural science background stemming into nutrition and found myself intrigued by the sociology piece that is largely overlooked with food. I experienced an epiphany that the detail-oriented and individualized vision of nutrition was not enough to actualize the larger issues that drive most of our food-related problems today. Um, I became fascinated in trying to find out why in a country so advanced can we not all be fed, food secure, and included, which led me to ask, you know, why don't people care and, and what drives them to instigate social change? Thus, I spent a couple of years researching and writing a master's thesis to dig further into this, 
um, by analyzing the relationship between structural injustice in the food system and our ability to empathize. I made some very important discoveries during this research, will, which I will be sharing parts of that um, with you today. So in reflecting on Will's presentation, I'd like to highlight the differences in democracy versus food democracy. Democracy is generally understood as a system of governance in which laws are directly or indirectly decided by the people. In my research, I found that the rhetoric and action surrounding the concept of democracy are empathy provoking because it enables the people to debate major topics of concern through open deliberation. As a result, democracy invites compassion, diversity, situational awareness, and it elicits participant mobilization in which collaboration and citizenship inspire people to design a world working to defeat injustice. Food democracy, in comparison, aims at boosting this participation among citizens by shying away from the powerful corporate food monopoly and going beyond the idea of food security, which focuses on health access to food for all. Food democracy delves more into the how, and one growing example of this is, um, ironically, food policy councils, which arose from North America in just the past few decades, um, and we view this type of food democracy as a prerequisite to reaching the goal of the right to food through food sovereignty and can create what has been termed food citizenship, where social responsibility transcends into belonging and participating. So our food system is far from democratic and quite far from adopting a right to food model. It exploits people for labor, animals for food, and the environment for food production. It is important to highlight its history as one that was built on the backs of displaced immigrants and in favor of white men who owned and controlled most land across the US and still do today. The first three examples of food system influencers you see here are all under the guise of capitalism, which as our prevailing US economic system has reaped financial success for the nation, but at the expense of others, such as the food system's overworked and underpaid workforce. Our capitalist food system creates an illusion of free choice. Lobbying groups pay large lump sums to influence food policies and social structures. Large corporations are getting larger by monopolizing the food economy and concentrating most profits into just a few companies' hands. Big farms, sometimes referred to as big ag, um, are often run by these large corporations and help determine what we buy from the grocery store by growing the commodity crops that are utilized in the majority of our food products, such as corn or soy. Uh, they also influence the farm bill and farm subsidies. And lastly, we have social constructs determ that determine our food choice because our identities hold an inherent discrimination inflicted on us by society. This category is one I will touch on further towards the end of this presentation as well. So in 2006, Obama gave a speech to the graduating class at Northwestern University in which he shared words that still ring true today and that bring me to the main focus of my research. He says, quote, there is a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit, but I think we should talk more about our empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to see the world through those who are different from us, the child who's hungry, the laid off steel worker, the immigrant woman cleaning your dorm room. As you go on in life, cultivating this quality of empathy will become harder, not easier. You'll be free to live in neighborhoods with people who care, who are exactly like yourself, and send your kids to the same schools and narrow your concerns to what's going on in your own little circle. Not only that, we live in a culture that discourages empathy. For those of us wondering what empathy really is, it is a psychosocial ability beyond imagining ourselves in the shoes of another person. It involves an effort in understanding that person's feelings and perspectives, and most importantly, using that understanding to guide your actions and better their situation. Most humans are born with the ability to empathize, but it is also a skill that we can train ourselves to be better at. 
It's understood to have three stages. Effective empathy involves mimicry, like catching a person's yawn or tearing when you see someone else crying. Cognitive empathy involves perspective taking. And empathic response is the step I'm most interested in because it incites a motivation to respond and express an urge to care about another person's welfare, which is vital if we want to move towards a more democratic food system. Nonetheless, a recent 30-year study done by the University of Michigan found that college students today are 30%, sorry, 40% less empathetic than our counterparts 30 years ago. Our political climate in the last few years has illustrated this as well, and some have pointed out that empathy is purposefully suppressed in this country to enable power only amongst a few. This is because empathy is a tool and a force for political change and social transformation. So I put this slide together just to illustrate how, em how empathy differs from other emotional attributes. As you can see, the more effort and understanding you exhibit, the closer you are to empathizing. Apathy is the opposite of empathy and involves a total lack of interest for or concern for others. Narcissism involves acknowledging others but putting your needs first. Pity is when you acknowledge others and are still removed from the situation. Sympathy is a step up because you are more engaged but are still viewing another person's perspective from your own perspective. And empathy is when you are actively trying to put forth the most engagement and effort because you are generally trying to understand that person's perspective and potentially react to help them. If there is one phrase that could accurately represent the image of today's US food system, it is food apartheid. Apartheid means apartness in the Afrikaans language, and it is a term used to describe the institutionalized racial segregation that took place in South Africa from 1948 to 1990. This phrase is slowly overtaking the term food desert because it more accurately symbolizes the root problems. Food desert makes a community feel desolate, when in fact it could very much be a vibrant place with culture and activity. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, social contra constructs highly influence our food choices, such as race, class, and gender. And that is largely because of the urban planning and redlining that developed in this country to segregate certain groups whereby marginalized communities of color were displaced into ghettos and subsidized housing, amongst other injustices, and demeaned by our food system since access to food largely became processed convenience food, which has inconveniently inflicted disadvantageous health disparities onto these groups. While the good food movement is now mainly focused on increasing access to food, a realistic next step is expanding the goals and creating a robust food democracy, which inspires much needed participant mobilization. We cannot rely on food corporations alone to do the work. Food democracy bridges the gap between food security and food sovereignty, and this would involve a more level playing field between corporate food players and consumers to make decisions surrounding food. A U.S. Food Democracy Council, for instance, could be established and have members appointed through our voting system to provide resources and assistance to states that are establishing or expanding their food policy councils. Through advocacy and policy, the aforementioned ideas can be established and further developed. And speaking of policy, Will and I will now alternate in going into a few policy solutions that are aligned with this robust food democracy model. So in my research, I discovered three areas that are actively building empathy. And the first is the field of education. There are several policies enacted in, around food and education in Florida, but most of them are focused on feeding programs. The, this proposal requires Florida school districts to incorporate the food system history into curriculum and offers a holistic agroecological education model that inspires empathy and future food system leaders to create innovation for upcoming generations. So by teaching historical patterns of discrimination and oppression, we get contextual understanding 
and macro perspective taking, which can inspire empathy amongst children. And this curriculum can be embedded into a number of class subjects from history to psychology and into the Florida Farm to School Initiative, which teaches kids about cooking, gardening, and local farming. And so thank you, Lana, that, that is excellent and a, and a nice segue too. Uh, and I would you know, add to that, that in terms of sort of practical policy solutions, we see this here, you know, conversations here in Hillsborough, it's already occurring in, in Pinellas, but in other counties. Uh, one way in which we can do that, make things just on a very simple level is to facilitate uh, the production of food on home yards and unused land, particularly in communities. And I, and I want to, to be sure to, to say that this is not a solution in the sense that we will uh, solve all food insecurity problems. But it will allow us, uh, back to my presentation, uh, regarding sort of eliminating policies and, pro and programs that, that, that <clears throat> detract from or do not allow us to produce our own food is one of the, the, the goals of looking at the human right to food from a food sovereignty paradigm. So allowing populations, our communities to grow and to sell uh, the food that we grow in our in our yards and in our communities um, allow populations to erect structures such as greenhouses hoop houses etc in their yards now i know there's some the controversy here we have certain regulations and codes that we have to abide by but some of those codes as i've seen in experience uh are very um difficult and and, and big obstacles for small growers uh, to abide by and there are, there's a lot to be done in terms of just those basic policy codes and state codes that can be reduced or eliminated uh, to allow people to produce their own food in their own yards. And at the very least, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, so again, policy solutions that demand government, city councils, and home associations to refrain from in, uh, implementing policies that impede the community's ability to produce its own foods. These are policies of non-interference, in other words. Thank you, Will. Um, and then the second part I found to activate empathy was technology. Several gadgets are now being developed to help people actually feel what it might be like to be someone else, such as virtual reality or even video games. Um, one could see what it might be like to work on a farm or through other medical empathy gadgets, feel the physical and social effects of um, being obese and consuming a typical American diet. Um, since there is a ton of research being done to discover tech-driven solutions, I propose a policy to help fund this type of research and other work that is addressing U.S. food system injustices. So this policy can be applied towards university research grants and even to organizations working on tools uh, such as GIS mapping, thank you Feed, one of our sponsors today, to show disparities across uh, specific geographic regions. Um, and the next policy will be presented by Will again. And so just to give you one example, as I talked about in my discussion, part of agroecology and food sovereignty as a whole, and, and, and something that is lost often in our traditional narratives is starting with the community first. So um, as a college professor, I'm guilty of this uh, on occasions, right? We talk a lot about uh, solutions. We talk about problems in the food system. Um, and we talk about what happens in, in, in food insecure neighborhoods. Uh, but yet we don't actually involve ourselves in those neighborhoods. We don't actually uh, visit. We don't actually get to meet people. I was uh, up in the university area CDC at the Harvest Hope Garden this morning briefly. Uh, um, here, an example that I would like to present today uh, as a good example of community solutions, the St. Pete Youth Farm, um, right? is an example, even though they are not necessarily sort of a food sovereignty advocate uh, on paper. This is what it looks like in practice, right? Starting as the community, as the St. Pete Youth Farm did, starting with asking the community, taking surveys, talking to people, looking what the needs are in that community, but from the community perspective, right? So uh, what does the community need from the community, by the community, and for the community? This is really what community food sovereignty looks like, as opposed to that term community food security, which is good and, and good intended. But again, food sovereignty uh, looks at the concrete, uh, looks at what food producers are able to, uh, are capable of doing, but also includes and incorporates the participation of the community members. So it involves a holistic approach in which all parties involved, everything from the children to the adults in the communities, to the academic researchers, to the people who can provide the farming and the, the, the technical knowledge uh, to produce these farms. They have to be involved from day one, not one step at a time, but from day one, 
um, developing and helping to develop this critical consciousness, as, as the scholar Paolo Fieri uh, mentions this, asking the community what they think the best solution is prior to any sort of government or nonprofit or volunteer engagement. Start with the community first, let the community allow itself to speak for itself, and then we begin to come up with solutions, in particular with relation to uh, food security. And this, uh, I would argue, is really at the core of both individual and community self-determination, which is at the heart of food sovereignty, as well as an agroecological method. And finally, to wrap it up, um, the, the youth farm provides a great transition into the, the third and perhaps most applicable area I found to activate empathy, which was narratives. Um, the phenomenon of storytelling serves really important purposes in changing our thinking and behavior with regard to others. Uh, this, pol thus, this policy serves to allow states and cities to hold spaces in public institutions to highlight the raw stories surrounding food, including the original food sovereignty movement and one day the community food sovereignty idea, which strays from traditional community food security since it focuses on community controlled food production that aligns with true participatory participatory democracy. Um, this type of policy could help implement interactive programs adapted from others like A Mile in My Shoes, where audio tapes and headphones are placed in a shoebox and you can listen to someone tell their story while actually wearing the owner's shoes. And events such as the Human Library, which started in Chicago, and allows you to check out a person rather than a book to learn about their story. Colleges can host these events with different themes, such as food workers in the U.S., and continue telling the often untold stories of our food system. So that wraps up our presentation. So now we will open the floor to questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lana and Will. Uh, truly outstanding. And I would just note, uh, as moderator of the forums, uh, for those that are going to be doing future forums with us, or if you're thinking about doing future forums, this is pretty much a model of what we'd like to see them go, how we'd like to see them go with good presentations and then policy proposals that are also part of the, uh, actually part of the program. So tremendous work for both of you. And I'm just seeing the chat box lighting up with a, a multitude of questions. Um, I'm going to get out of the way now. I'm going to turn it over to Kendra, who will field the questions and uh, present them to Will and Lana or both of you. So, Kendra, if you want to take over now fielding the questions, it's all yours. Sure. Well, thank you so much again, Will and Lana, for the fantastic presentations. Um, just blown away today by the information. We did have quite a few questions in the chat box, so uh, we'll just take those one by one. And then I think uh, today we will maybe open up the phone lines for a question or two as well towards the end. Our first question is from Sarah, who asks, what does it actually mean to say, determine our own food system, as in just who decides, how does this possibly feed all the people in a town at the various types of food need? Um, what if many, are perfectly content with the local grocery store. Sure, I can go ahead and field that one. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And the answer to that in sticking to a true food sovereignty model is, is trusting that yes, in fact, there will be some people that make that decision. But in working with communities as I have, I think what we will find is many people are not content with that, uh, that communities do want to have healthier food. Uh, they they do not necessarily want to, and I think this is a misperception. We often find that 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 that, that folks think that you know the the status quo is is, is acceptable. That certain unhealthy food uh, practices and consumption practices are what people actually want, um, and that's not always the case. Um, so first, I would sort of challenge that uh, assumption. Um, but in sticking with true food and participatory democracy, we have to allow for that uh, decision to be made. Um, again. This is part of the activism element to it. This is part of the education element to it. We can still have these conversations in which we allow folks to make those decisions for themselves, but we can also show alternatives. The alternative of what a healthy food system looks like, the alternative of what uh, a plant-based, in some cases, uh, diet might look like, the alternative of what uh, growing your own food and serving that food around the table might look like. So that is really where, as Lana presented, sort of the, the, the food democracy comes into play there. Yeah, and I'd just like to add to that, that in terms of what determining our food system means, 
it is just that. It is having the people come together and discuss what we want it to look like, discuss the guidelines that we want to um, take place around our food when it comes to growing, production, distribution, um, that kind of thing, and kind of working together with food corporations because they're not going to go away. Um, you know, to kind of make these larger decisions together because at the end of the day, the consumers are the ones eating the food. So, you know, we, we all are. So we kind of have to think of it more as, like Will said, participatory democracy, where we're all kind of socially responsible to help determine this and what that might look like. Thank you. The next question we had was from Trent. He said, I can see pushback against large industrial agriculture, large corporation. I don't understand the same criticism of markets. Uh, they are very different. We can create more uh, just markets and platforms. Markets that are well-regulated are the most efficient means to distribute food. So would either of you like to comment on that? Um, I don't know if I'm understanding the question correctly, but um, well, first of all, yes, I do think that there will be pushback. But um, in, in my research of doing empathy, the most powerful people are the ones who would benefit the most from learning empathic skills. And um, by presenting them with those kinds of opportunities, we can potentially lessen the pushback and kind of have us see, have them see the other side um, and work together with us. That's one piece. Um, the second part about the markets is there perhaps is a way to create more just markets. Right now, what we have is a free market um, that's run through capitalism and that doesn't necessarily allow everyone the same access and equal opportunity to uh, participate in the market. Um, not everyone has the same resources to be able to open a business, to be able to um, buy the same resources. And so the free market design um, is not really working for everyone right now. Um, it's very biased towards certain groups who have more, um, you know, more uh, leeway in working the system. Um, and so designing more just markets is definitely something that we need to work towards. And I would just real briefly add to that in its sort of origins, food sovereignty and food sovereignty movements, globally speaking, challenge, challenge the notion not of free markets necessarily and free trade necessarily, but the form in which it was espoused by governments like the United States, in which in reality it was not true, right? This is really historically uh, the espousal of a free market, but in fact, we still have massive billions of dollars that are uh, you know, spent on subsidizing our, our corporate agricultural regimes, so on and so forth. And so uh, when we talk about the reformulation or rethinking of markets in many ways the challenge is not necessarily to challenge the market itself which i might might personally do myself but in fact just uh ensure that we are honest about the types of markets that we are operating in first and foremost and just as a follow-up to that question uh trent also asked how about supporting and buying from our florida small-scale farmers Absolutely, I think that's kind of one of the, the the starting points, and we want to we want to build those relationships. We want to allow us the, the greater access to, and we want to have more of those local small scale uh, farmers to ensure that we can move towards those more robust food security you know systems where we are actually uh, you know bringing the food production closer to home. Great, and another question we had comes from Anthony. Anthony asks. Would the presenters agree that a lack of having a policy for food agency democracy is indeed a policy to deter food democracy? And what would be the remedy for lack of policies? Hmm. Well, Anthony, I'll, I'll take a step. I mean, I think part of what I mentioned um, today is the policies that we have in place that are related to food production tend to be policies that impede our ability to produce food. So you're right in the sense that we need to have more policy proposals, which I think, you know, sort of uh, we've established uh, some, some ideas here to begin with, but also to address the policies that we have in place that are, um, uh, you know, 
eliminating the possibility for us to to, prov to, to provide and grow our own food. I think there's uh, plenty of those um, that are around today that, that we can challenge. Uh, and in a, in a sense, it is sort of getting out of the way. I will also add too, this is where the political becomes a problem, right? And the political needs to transcend just our simple uh, political institutions in the traditional sense of the word. We need to start looking at things like HOA, like that, the housing, you know, sort of uh, infrastructures. We have to start looking at community policies, uh, whether they're formal or not. Um, and, and that's where the political tends to escape sort of the traditional sort of, you know, the Tallahassee type of model. And it becomes political in the sense of true sort of political activism from the ground up in which we subvert in some cases, uh, many of the political and legal institutions um, as a way to, um, you know, start to rethink of these things. I'll give you just one example too. And I did not mention this in my presentation, but we can look to, you know, for, for example, we can look to when we talk about food justice movements, there, there's research, uh, uh, for example, related to food justice that looks to the Black Panther Party, for example, and their community, uh, the, their community lunch pr or breakfast programs, right, as models to take control take control over our food systems, right? And so to that extent, that is apolitical uh, in the traditional sense of working within the paradigm of, of, of politics. Just one sort of future uh, research model that I think uh, is worth exploring. And I'd like to add too, if I understood the question correctly, um, I think they were also trying to ask whether having like the US Food Democracy Council type of thing would contradict um, kind of uh, in enforcing a food democracy model. Um, and I don't think that it might seem that way, but I feel like um, if we are using our democratic system to vote for people to represent um, a council who could at least not control um, the you know food policy councils in other states, but just to provide resources and kind of gear, have them gear towards starting up and um, becoming established across the country. So I hope that kind of answers that question too. Thank you. And we did have another question, which was, how can local municipalities, um, how, how can we get the municipalities more involved? I think this is, this is where it really comes down to, to grassroots organizing um, uh, because and, and, you know, Dell might even be able to answer this as uh, I know you're not on the panel, Dell. Um, but but when it comes from in order for it to have success, right, the, that that power does have to come from the people first. Um, and, and so in order for the I mean, the attention of the municipalities, you know, and, and the people um, to be more involved, I guess, you know, again, starts with the community. I'm not sure if that really uh, helps as much, but again, if we start with the community first and the community starts to voice, or at least knows that their voice can be heard, then the political structures will start to, to, to take heed. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that between the community first and the policy piece is the, is the advocacy component. So communities would be the people um, and the force advocating for getting local munis municipalities involved and getting other um, you know big players such as you know corporate food um, you know giving them a seat at the table and kind of ev having everyone um, discuss it but as far as local municipalities definitely that community advocacy piece um, is super important I'm gonna weigh in on this is my mic on Kendra I'm gonna accept Will's invitation to join I uh, is uh, is Erica, our president, on the line too? Is she is he she attending? I think she and I could both address this very briefly. I'll just say I'll make three points relative to uh, engagement in municipal planning. One is become familiar. If you're interested in uh, activating municipal government's involvement in this, you as an individual or participant in a group are advised to become familiar with the structures of your city government. Most people plunge into these activities having no idea about what the structures of the municipal government are or what the structure of their county government may be. They don't know how to participate. So try to understand what the structures are within your city so that you can actually advocate in a powerful and effective way. Two, as Lana mentioned, and I think I'm following up on what she said, is see if you can develop a coalition, a group of folks that will speak to an issue as a group 
So you're not a lone wolf that's just going up there and advocating and going to a city council meeting and trying to make a case. Go with a community, go with a group, go with power as you make the presentations that you're interested in. And third, to the degree that you possibly can, advocate for a structure within city government that will focus on these issues, such as an environmental board, an agricultural board, an agrarian board. Advocate for that so that you do have a seat at the table. The surest way to get that is to get a part of the city government itself to be dedicated to the, to the interests that you are celebrating. And if Erica's on, I'd love her to make a short comment too, because she's been active as well. I don't believe Erica is with us. Um, I know was, Anthony is, but okay. I don't think Erica's okay. with us today. All right, I know Anthony, good Anthony. Um, well, why don't we, um, perhaps we can open up uh, the phone lines for one question. Um, I see we do have a few people on the phone. If you are on the phone and you would like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself by pushing the star button and the number six. Um, so we'll open up the line just for a question from the phones. And if we don't have any questions from the phones, then we can take probably one or two more questions before wrapping up today. Can I real quick, uh, I noticed in the chat, uh, Ms. Uh, Pineda, Lisa Pineda asked a question. In the past, I've noticed that most initiatives that have uh, faltered relied on volunteer labor. I Now, I can't speak personally in terms of actual um, research studies, that I've conducted myself, but I, I think this is an excellent uh, question. And this is really where you get to a crux when it comes to funding organizations, right? That that, that are volunteer based or that rely on volunteer labor while good um, are not always a guarantee. Uh, when you have, uh, you know, sort of a, a recycling of volunteers, especially when, and, and the farmers on this list can, can testify to this, right? Uh, if you teach a group of students, for instance, you know, how, uh, when to harvest a certain crop or how to take care of a certain crop, you need a certain level of consistency there, right? Or else you will, uh, you know, kids, for instance, will start picking crops when they're not supposed to, or start, you know, doing things, you know, not uh, with ill intent, um, but you need sort of a consistency, which is why the volunteer model is difficult. That is often the times where we get the biggest resources, right? The most amount of people willing to come and learn, but in order to have a truly sustainable system, right? Um, it has to begin. And this is why the community involvement is so important. It cannot rely uh, uh, to the, at the end of the day, extensively on volunteers that are coming in from the outside of the community. It has to, it can begin with that. It can, it can use volunteer help to start, but that volunteer help has to eventually transition out of those communities, unless those volunteers, in fact, live in the communities themselves, uh, enabling and empowering the community itself uh, to continue on with the work, whether it be a community garden or any sort of food production related activity. Wonderful, thank you, Will. Um, so it looks like we don't have any questions from the callers. We do have one other question in the chat box, which is, uh, what do you think is the cause for decline in empathy and do you think there is a relationship between decline in empathy and technology, specialization, uh, less engagement with the natural world, less understanding and experience of the human relationship within our ecosystems? Definitely. So um, to me, I think the decline in empathy can be attributed to probably two big things. Of course, there are other factors. Um, the first being um, in the large focus on individualism in this country, which is kind of the thing that we hear about, like everyone for themselves. Um, we tend to not think of um, others in respect to how we think of ourselves. And there's a really big focus on kind of um, this competitive state of us individually climbing and not as a whole. Um, nation or as a whole species or etc. Um, so the ideology of individualism, which is largely attributed to capitalism, is um, you know very detrimental to igniting empathy um, because we're forced to not really care about others um, and kind of focus uh, you know more selfishly on ourselves. Um, the second thing is that there's something called empathy fatigue in which um, because of all of the social problems we endure in the world, uh, we kind of get tired of seeing all of the issues on the TV, on the news, and we start to feel hopeless and kind of, um, you know, stop 
stop trying to empathize because it, it, it's tiring and it's exhausting physically on our bodies. Um, this is definitely something that I think a lot of us experience, especially now during COVID, um, but it's definitely something um, that we kind of have to just accept the idea that, you know, social injustice is kind of always probably going to be there, but we can always do our best by taking, you know, one step at a time, one day at a time to doing something to better the situation. It doesn't have to be this giant um, change um, because as we all know, change does happen very slowly and very gradually. So um, this is something that we kind of have to work on um, with baby steps and we have to kind of just sit back and accept that we each have a role to play in bettering the situation of others. And I would just add to that, thanks Lana, uh, a final remark. When we talk about empathy, right, and, and that emp empathy fatigue, right, if we're going to experience that fatigue, which undoubtedly will happen if we are committed to, uh, you know, providing food, se food security uh, for underserved uh, communities, let that empathy um, fatigue arise from being active in the community, being involved, making friendships with people who are food insecure, walking side by side and experiencing, as Lana mentioned in the, you know, you know, it shoes in, in, you know, wearing someone else's shoes, actually get your shoes muddy with the community members side by side and allow that fatigue to enter in that way rather than by watching it on TV, right? And that is really where I, at least personally, have experienced, right, empathy in the sense that when I can see and talk to and befriend folks who are food insecure, Right. This is only truly when we will be able to understand the importance of not only a food, a more food democratic society, but truly what it means to try to strive toward a more food just society as well. Beautifully said. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I want to just express uh, appreciation and celebration of what our two tremendously talented and insightful uh, presenters have shared with us as well. I think. Uh, you know, any moment, any five minute segment of this uh, presentation today, today's forum, any five minute slot <laughs> is an education in itself. I do want to remind everyone that this presentation will be posted on the website of the Florida Food Policy Council. So it will be available whenever you want to go to it. If you want to share it with someone else, this is an education in itself. It's like a graduate seminar. Uh, in the topic of uh, food democracy, food justice, and of course, issues related to human rights. So tremendous presentation. Um, Kendra, I'm gonna ask you if you could tell us a little bit about our next food forum, which will be a month from now on the last Friday of the month. Every, every month, last Friday, 12 o'clock noon, we have a Florida Food Forum. Everyone's welcome to attend. Kendra, if you would tell us about our next one. Sure, and again, thank you to both Lana and Will for your fantastic presentations, and thank you to everyone for joining us for the forum today. Our next forum is going to be on the last Friday of April, April 30th, and it's going to be on the topic of youth in the food system. So we're going to hear from Artha Jonasson, who is the Southern Region Vice President of the National Future Farmers of America. And we're also going to hear from Lyrica, Zaira, and Nadira, who are the CEOs and founders of Born Brilliant LLC, which is a plant-based business in Tallahassee. So we'll be hearing from them about their experiences as youth in the food system. And as Del mentioned, we will be posting a recording of this on our channels, on our website, on our YouTube next week. And if we weren't able to get to any of your questions, please send us an email. Our email is info, info at flfpc.org. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kendra. Uh, please do consider sharing a contribution uh, with a Florida Food uh, Policy uh, Council or even becoming a member. We encourage membership, we encourage sponsorship, and we encourage donations. This is a not-for-profit organization that survives it all through community support. Your support and sponsorship will continue will allow us to continue to do these forums. And we do want to thank our, our sponsors for today, which is Feed and Jay Haskins Law. Thank you to them. And thank you to all of you for joining us for this month's Florida Food Forum. Thank you to Will. Thank you to Lana. And thank you to everyone. Goodbye now. And have a
a wonderful rest of the day, weekend, and week ahead.